wait, wait, wait. With fucking, every video call, fucking, I have the guy who's known for Zoom calls, and we end up starting it on mute. <laughs> fucking perfect. No, no, no. Seriously, like I, I have a, I have a mug that's specifically. <laughs> I can't even find it. It says you're on mute yeah. just because the amount of times this happens is crazy. So I think that's the perfect opener. That's perfect. Actually. <laughs> right. Okay. Hello, everybody. <laughs> this is Guy Blomberg. It's great. <laughs> um, uh, ah. notable industry. Uh figure socialite what do you what do we call you i don't know what we call you what's what's you you want to introduce yourself because i'm going to do a butchered job now. no no i really don't know i want to no you you okay. do it come All on right. i so want to hear what you got based off of my limited <laughs> research uh, uh i would say you are a game industry socialite uh that uh and community coordinator slash organizer you have a great habit of bringing people together whether that is through uh, uh gatherings conventions um uh, a bar at one point in time uh you you have a, a history of um social organization within the gaming space and people seem to like you a lot and i i'm here to figure out why because i knew nothing about you before you got recommended <laughs> so oh, that's that's uh that's lovely socialite that's that's very paris hilton -y, isn't it i'm not quite at that particular level uh i like the fact that i'm enigmatic and mm -hmm. and kind of behind the scenes and you'd heard of me uh i think i think that's actually great so uh, sure that sounds really good i like that yeah great right. description so you uh run something called the games industry gathering uh I do. which is as far as i can tell an online uh meetup of sorts for developers and other industry folks kind of like one of these shows but with i guess like 500 windows going at the same time well so uh the the gig as as we colloquially call it mm -hmm. uh was was born out of the the strong desire to just see people during mm -hmm. the pandemic right so the pandemic hit and we're all at home and we're all like oh isn't this this is kind of it weird isn't it let's all do zoom calls and i'm sure we'll keep in touch and this will be great but of course you know very soon after we realized it's going to be take take quite a while to come out of it mm -hmm. and uh we won't be out we weren't able to go to conventions or actually see each other in person and the thing is like if you know someone you can call them up or you can be in an email chat you can you can talk to them but if you don't know someone how do you connect with people you don't know over the internet it's kind of weird the internet's designed to actually connect strangers mm -hmm. and yet I, I think a lot of people were in the same position as me where we kind of found that's like oh if i want to network or i want to socialize with other people in in the games industry but and meet people i don't know which i used to do at conventions and especially at hotel bars around conventions it's the pandemic how do how do i do that do i join a i guess a discord and text people do i like it was it was a really weird scenario right and all the conventions and stuff were focused on panels and streaming so the gig was born from that desire and we just started a little zoom call with a bunch of us and and it grew and the the idea is yeah you get like hundreds of people in there but you don't really see like a big screen with hundreds of people. That's annoying. A fucking Zoom call is annoying when you get more than 10 people on it. Like you talk over each other. It's terrible. But the idea was every 20 minutes, we randomly put people into breakout rooms of between four to six people. And you've got that common interest that you're all professionals in the games industry of one way or another. You're media or content, content creators or journalists or developers. And so for 20 minutes, you can introduce yourselves, but you probably got something to talk about doesn't necessarily have to be about you know what you're working on it could just be did you watch that e3 conference or you know how terrible is the food at conventions usually or you know whatever the conversation may be and that kind of skyrocketed to turn into this weirdly professional organization with now over 3,000 global members called the games industry gathering so an absolute accident that has been a lifesaver during this pandemic, pretty much. Because, mm -hmm. I mean, <clears throat> in in games in particular, I mean, I'm sure in any creative medium, but in games especially, uh, it, you know, that uh, connection and col uh, for collaboration is really important. I've personally, you know, kind of set out at the beginning of this year to start collaborating with more creators and being relative in, in relative isolation have found it incredibly difficult um, to... to to connect with people um yeah. has the gig 
facilitated any significant collaborations that you're aware of? Yeah, actually, there's there's a bunch of oh god, I'm not gonna be able to name any off the top of my head, but there's a bunch of folks that have actually, uh, and you know what? I got an email from uh oh, oh god, I can't remember his name. Um, but uh, he works. He he'd connected with uh, a wonderful um uh a composer by the name of Elvira that's doing some stuff over in Sweden, I think. Mm -hmm. Uh, and uh, he was in the UK, and there was another developer with them in america and they'd connected through the gig and now he's working on the music for their game uh and whatnot there's another thing called only cans i think which came out of a collaboration oh, really? for our folks in the gig um like they just met i mean here's the thing like I, the gig's not going to take responsibility for that yeah, yeah, yeah. it shouldn't in the same way that like oh i met this person at gdc gdc is the reason this game exists no it's just the the medium that people connected but i i guess the question on the other side is what else was there you know, during the pandemic? Like, I don't know, man. Like, outside of like just randomly DMing people, uh, I don't know how to connect with other other random people in the games industry during this pandemic. So I think for a lot of people, this has been uh, the only thing they had, and it's actually been not shit, frankly. So, which most Zoom calls are. Most video calls are terrible, uh, but this one has not been. So, right, yeah. Right, right. Um, the, 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 so um, conventions were a big part of your existence prior to pandemic. Could you walk us through a little bit of that? Because I know you had some involvement um, with, with Pax Oz, uh, but I, 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 did. Don't, I don't know the full extent of That's anything. all right, man. Yeah. So I, um, I was the global gaming content director for a company called ReadPop, uh, and oversaw uh, the PAXs in, in North America. That's East, West, South. I'm going to say Unplugged, but I really didn't do much on Unplugged. I'm, a, I'm not a real tabletop person. Uh, and PAX Oz, but also uh, the EGX Eurogamer Expo over in, uh, in the UK, and EGX Res, and EGX Berlin. Uh, and then I also worked to try and launch a bunch of gaming events in France and Singapore and Korea and China. Uh, and uh, Vienna, and so like I was part of this. They are the largest pop culture organization in the world, and my focus and my speciality for ten years was the gaming content. So that is the panels, the free play areas, tournament areas, uh, new initiatives. So working with focus groups or underrepresented groups to do, uh, you know, new spaces or you know things like the diversity lounge or packs together or the Latinx spaces or, uh, and really just being a, a, a pretty forward facing person. Uh, and representative of those events to try and make sure we were, you know, always doing new things or, you know, um, uh, trying new things and getting really cool content and all this kind of stuff. It was a lot of fun. Physical events are are wild, man. Like PAX is is the the best of the best. Like it's bringing the community together in a really authentic way. Uh, and it's not just about standing in line for two hours to play a an unreleased game. Right. It's really about, you know, trying to create that Woodstock for Gamers moment where you come together, meet a bunch of, and again, it's like about meeting a bunch of random people with the same interests and forging those relationships and connections, then walking away from that going, well, I've just made a bunch of new friends. So, uh, yeah, I did that for uh, about eight years. And then, you know, there was a fucking pandemic. <laughs> <laughs> Physical events weren't the industry to be in during that time. Right. The, uh, there's been a, a number of digital transitions for events. I mean, PAX Online was a thing. Uh, I'm, I'm, Online is happening right now, actually. I'm, it is, yeah. I, I'm quite a fan of the way Amaze uh, delivered their uh, yeah. digital event. was really cool. Um, yep. there, there's a bunch of different takes on it. Is there any, like now that we're, I guess, a, a year plus into digital conventions, have, have you seen anything, any really good lessons that we've learned from that in terms of showcasing digitally? Yeah, I think uh, the two big mistakes were made early on by a lot of convention organizers. And the first one is that they thought digital would be easy to transition to because a lot of the content and panels that people do, they're just like, yeah, you can just make that digital. Mm -hmm. I think what a lot of people didn't expect was that everyone was going to do that. And all of a sudden, we're inundated with content. Why tune in to a live stream of this convention when you can just watch it later? I mean, look at what happened with E3 and, you know, Keeley's uh you know summer game fest and ign's and every other fest or thing that had happened for 
three months. Like it was just too much, too much content. And I think, uh, you know, people kind of missed the boat on that a little bit. And I think what the, the biggest difference with, you know, virtual stuff that happens, you know, or streams that happen with your, your IGNs or GameSpots or major gaming websites versus conventions, conventions are designed to actually bring people together. Mm -hmm. And I think watching a panel is a very passive experience and what the conventions are supposed to do is actually have a much more interactive experience uh even more so than twitch where you're just in the chat and talking but uh there are a couple of folks that i think did a really good job from a from a b2c uh a business uh to consume uh b2b business to business the conferences or things like this i think uh there was a t there was a piece of software called pine which was used by uh um devgam and uh, uh i think the the australian uh gcap event and that that was actually really good at at uh you know um getting folks to interact meet to match is another really good piece of software it's been just attached to every gaming convention uh conference and has been integral to people actually connecting to each other and the other one is um uh the super crowd um indie arena booth uh uh set up oh. so they actually completely recreated an isometric pixel based game where every level that you go into is a completely different exhibit a whole or there's like arcade machines that are different indie games that are exhibitors and there's like media lounges and like just and then basically created a game for a convention and they're doing the same thing for dreamhack beyond and that's been i think that one's been really cool just because it, it's visually different mm -hmm. do you know what i mean so but it's been hard i think it's been hard for most conventions to actually provide stuff that's been uh you know authentic and genuine and and interesting your attention away from whatever disney plus movie you're watching right right it's yeah it is um the the attention economy or whatever is re everything being oversaturated already and then now having to like try and where you used to have a foothold um and and trying to adapt into a hyper saturated sector is is, is I, I totally get the difficulty in that it's like um you know game releases in general there's just there's just too much now and now we're also fighting for the for the showcase space um, well this is the thing every everyone thinks about i mean time is a finite resource that that people have right and conventions were able to occupy that time because they were a a set period of like this weekend and you knew if you were going to go to that convention it's like well this is my weekend this is my time i allocate towards this and and that's your 24 hours you're going to a hotel you're going like that's your event right whereas when you turn it to an online space you can watch a panel or you can go play a game you can well you know flick on netflix like you know you can check some emails like it's it's less focused and because of that it's hard to capture people's attention so you know i think that's the thing they've all been struggling with uh greatly and i don't know if anyone really nailed it uh that well during the the pandemic you know so i don't know i think everyone's going to get back to physical events with a, a little bit of digital components but i don't I, I didn't really i don't think i saw anyone really nail it keely did some really good stuff i think but uh but outside of that yeah yeah, that that was a, that was going to be one of my next questions. Was like, how do you see, you know, with this digital experiment having sort of com coming to its end, um, how do you see the world transitioning? I mean, we I've I've heard a lot of things from developers that have really appreciated, like the Steam Games Festival, where um, you know you can get tons of de people playing your demo and wish list far more than you could at a physical event, um, but at the same time, you know, it's it's kind of super saturated and getting the attention in there can be even more difficult um it so how, how do you think it's going to change going forward it, it depends what you're after right and you're a developer you you know this sort of thing you know if you go to an event like what are you trying to get out of it are you trying to get as many wish lists as possible are you trying to get as much media or content creators to actually talk about your game in order to maybe you want to actually just talk it up so you can get in front of a publisher or an investor to actually you know uh to not, maybe you're just trying to actually promote it to an audience and try and get as much wish list wish list as possible just, maybe just getting play testers <laughs> yeah yeah exactly maybe maybe you're using and a lot of people would do this with packs they'd use the date yeah. as a as a date to push a build in order to push the team to deliver a playable build an alpha build at that particular time so it was playable to an order like they'd use that as as your your benchmark in your development timeline to get to that point and then there's something amazing about 
tangibly seeing people play your game mm -hmm. that while you're screw um, while you're squirreled away developing it you don't it's hard to have perspective until you see you know some kid come up and actually get it and that's like fuck we're doing the right like you know th there's those moments that you really only get at a physical event but it's hard to put a dollar figure on that and justify it i i, I think the the biggest thing to come out of all the events around the world having to go digital is the accessibility of those events and that audience to a much larger underrepresented audience folks that are in you know south africa southeast asia or whatnot like getting to gdc in san francisco it's fucking expensive enough expensive enough getting to san francisco and gdc when you live in america like right. it's it's expensive you know so uh you know it's kind of leveled the playing field a lot and i feel that in, in my experiences over the last year uh i've gotten to know and meet and interact with way more people from way more countries than i ever did as literally the person flying around the world putting on and running conventions in in all the different countries like this last year has actually been eye-opening and my my biggest hope is that a lot of conventions continue to have a strong significant digital component that they don't just dismiss that because the commercial opportunities with physical is so much greater so we'll see with with that sort of digital floodgate having been broken, the barrier being cracked a little bit now do you see then any opportunity for the online space sort of coming into the physical and getting those international developers or hard hard to travel developers somehow digitally into physical spaces does that even make sense you got you got to look at it. unfortunately you've got to look at it from a commercial point of view right mm -hmm. like all the large conventions are all are, are owned by large multinational conglomerates for the most part and you know uh you've got to look at the the sponsorship opportunities and the exhibitor booth costs and whatnot and really unless you you get uh uh, sponsorships or, or um, you know, in, investment from foundations or whatnot to support underrepresented developers, you know, coming across the line. Like, uh, it, it, you've got to, you've got to, you've got to work at it. You've got to actually, you've got to actually put the thought and resources and realize that it's not a commercial opportunity. Mm -hmm. Like, you know, supporting developers from other countries to come you know, to America and come to a convention or something is, is not a revenue generator, you know, like that's, that's the, the cold hard truth of it. So, uh, I, my hope though, is that there are significant enough digital components that people will still care about, uh, which will provide an opportunity to those developers and folks in other regions to still take part, to still have meaningful meetings, to still, uh, you know, meet with investors or publishers or still get, you know, promotion to media or content creators, that would be, that would be really cool if that was, uh, if that was to happen. But, but we'll see, man. I mean, keep in mind as well, like when we talk about uh, events going digital, all of a sudden they're in the same space as your media outlets. So IGN and GameSpot and, and, uh, and Polygon and all these, all these groups. So they're competing for the same sponsorship dollars they're competing for the same audience numbers like the digital space is incredibly uh competitive so for physical events to actually go in that space is is dangerous territory that that you know they're not used to so yeah right. does um, that answer your question i'm not sure if it does so yeah, we, we get, we're getting there um okay i guess i want to talk a little bit more high-mindedly about like we t you, you mentioned a big part of the convention experience and the physical event experience is that um social interaction and doing things together right we're going and checking out this game together or whatever and in the development space i've i've often had this conversation with other developers where is my game good or are people playing friendship right that that idea of you know i've made a cool multiplayer game but are people actually is this actually a good game or are people just enjoying playing together um and so i'm 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 curious for your perspective on the like does it always benefit to, to to have a multiplayer component where you can access friends you know like what what value do you put on a game um that allows you to interact with with your friends and, and other people do you specifically mean at conventions 
no 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 outside of conventions in in as a as a as a game you know as a as oh a, as a hardcore game um, myself you know oh as a as a hardcore game of myself uh oh also just as a side note like mm -hmm. uh in in your did you ever exhibit at conventions did you yeah, ever yeah, go yeah. down that path oh yeah, have yeah, to deal yeah. With i've it? done i've done pax east pass west uh australia yeah cool we've been at egx res we done PAX e australia? Yeah, oh, that's, amazing. Yeah, yeah. that's awesome thank yeah. you so much because no. it was so hard to get people to come down to australia it's a no, long flight i still have the fucking letter from the uh, australian minister or whatever thanking us for <laughs> for coming yeah uh, <laughs> it was great every time when we were doing pax australia like every time an international developer or, or guest would actually come down we were just they were just blown away by how thankful everyone was like because <laughs> yes. every australian is like look we know we're a long way away thank you so much for coming and then when those developers would go to pax east and they're you know pe people are there it's like yeah whatever i'm gonna play call of duty it's, it's just yeah, it's a completely yeah. different thing yeah. um so multiplayer games uh well okay first of all, I, I love um i love uh couch-based multiplayer games personally but that's because my career has been based around physical events and bringing people together so i used to run all these gaming uh cocktail bars and the best games there were pick up and play turn-based multiplayer video games because you want people to interact and there's the the natural behavior of of gamers when you're playing a, a multiplayer game whether that be a two-player street fighter or a uh a, a, or play a new super mario brothers or, or a smash or whatever is when you lose you look around and you're like oh so who's next right so it's this it's this great psychological inbuilt thing to interact with a stranger when you lose because you need to pass the controller on mm -hmm. and there's an there's an amazing power in that when it comes to public events uh, or public spaces or even even parties or things like this like the best thing about party games is yeah, you, you play with your friends, but even if you have a party where there's people that don't know each other, they can get to know each other by that interaction of either playing with each other, but even just even just the the movement of actually passing a controller or giving your control to someone else. There's a real authenticity in that that I think is is overlooked a lot of the time. Uh, and when it came to events and conventions, especially like just in, incredible because you'd get people that would stay on but they pass the controller to some other people would pass the controller to someone else and then they're playing against strangers that they'd never met mm -hmm. and then they're talking and they're sharing this experience and that is one of the my favorite aspects of, of video games ever not just online gaming is is a thing absolutely that's that's fine but like i and maybe i'm just a little old school in this mm -hmm. respect but like i really love the the physical interactions that you get between strangers with couch based multiplayer games there's there's this notion in, in those kind of in developing those kind of games that you're not designing the game as much as you are designing the room right you you you're 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 focusing on the social construct that that the game in in, in, in enables uh the inhibitions it drops uh, yeah. And it's a it's a it's a it's a whole nother level of game development that I'm not really that good at yet. Um, but I'm oh, curious, I... what do you think are like the telltale signs of you've 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 started to affect uh, as a designer and a developer? What are those telltale signs that you've started to affect the social interactions of the people standing around your game? I think from what I've seen and from the the developers that I've talked to, there was actually one of my favorite. Uh, uh, couch-based multiplayer games is one that not many people know about, but it was in incredibly popular at our bar, uh, and it was called. Um, I was about to say Castle Crashes, but no, it was. <laughs> Never heard of it. Uh, <laughs> yeah, <laughs> no, uh, it was called Rascals, right. right? Rascals, and it was actually by a developer called Halfbrick. Uh, Half yes, yes, very, very good. And they obviously did Fruit Ninja, mm -hmm. and Fruit Ninja, this little tiny game that. Did everyone paid attention to whatever, but Rascals was this console-based multiplayer game in the same vein as um, Castle Crashes, I guess, but it was much more of a, a, a race to the end with four players. And I remember uh, I knew a lot of the developers personally, and their whole and they at the uh, uh, they set the game up way before launch in our bar, uh, and it was a great way for them to actually focus test it with mm -hmm. with the public and whatnot. And watching the de developers watch other people play it and realize that, okay, well, the minute details of this level 
this component of this level has to change because if there's three people moving through this particular gap, then it's not going to work. Uh, and, and people are people are going to get frustrated. And then there's the, the old Mario Kart like catch-up system. Like if someone's coming first, do they get slowed down while the person coming last speeds up? Or more importantly, the person coming last gets the better uh, power-ups while the person coming first gets coins. You know, it's like, what's, how do you, how do you uh, get the elasticity between the players to actually make it feel like it's competitive, uh, but still feel like it's a challenge? Uh, and make it so people, when they win, they feel they authentically won, but people that lost don't feel angry mm-hmm. and that it's unfair that they lost. That balance and that mechanic is, I think, a secret source that I have no fucking idea <laughs> how how you can arrive at outside of just hundreds of hours of, of focus testing and play testing and watching people play it for the first time not watching people play it for the hundredth time Mm -hmm. but watching people play it for the first time uh, or the second time or or something to that degree i think uh i I, yeah i'm in awe of uh you know developers that create games uh like that because i think it's it's so difficult to actually capture that that particular element I have very faint memories of Rascals. I remember playing it on XBLA a long, long time back. I do remember having a good time with it, but I can't, for the life of me, remember what the game, how the game worked. It, it was very forget. It was very forgettable. It was just, it, but but for some reason, right? It, it, at, in this tuning. in this bar environment, like it just it resonated so much, and I, I think that's the thing is like. Uh, it it was an XBLA title. It required couch based co op. It was kind of nondescript. It really didn't have much backing or promote. I, I think it kind of came and and went and kind of faded away and didn't really make much of a splash. But for us, we had it in our venue, and we would we would change games around like you know based on how popular they were. You know the consistent ones were Street Fighter. Mm-hmm. Uh, New Super Mario Brothers was actually pretty good. Four player Mario. Uh, you know, Mario platformer that was that was always a, a, a pretty good winner. Um, Castle Crashes was very popular. Call of Duty was actually split screen Call of Duty was actually pretty popular. Um, but and and then there are a bunch of other games as well. But like Rascals, we kept, people would request it when they came back in, um, and I think it 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 had that same sort of Castle Crashes kind of vibe to it, where it was pick up and play. But if you played a lot then you were going to get a lot out of it. But that didn't mean that you get way more out of it to the degree that it would, you would not be able to play with someone where it was their first time. So when we talk about that fine tuning period, can you, how long was it in uh, the bar before uh, release? Do you know? Uh, it was there when we, so we, la- this was the mana bar, which was, uh, we launched it in 2010 uh, in, uh, this, is a, this is ten years. This is a decade ago. God, I feel old. Um, uh, it was a, it, it was available when we launched the bar, uh, and I think the game came out six months after that. Uh, so, yeah, it was it was really cool, and actually, it was a big coup for us to actually have an unreleased game playable right. at the bar, developed by a local developer that was actually globally renowned. So it was that was I think we were very fortunate in that respect, and they were really good, really good sports about it. Um, are there any types of games that like absolutely flopped in that social setting? Like, what would what what would what what did you have, or even th- surprisingly, did not do well? Yeah. So, uh, what would frustrate me is because uh, so context here, right? So, uh, I launched, uh, I I created this thing called the Mana Bar, and the Mana Bar was a cocktail video game bar but don't think like you're you're uh you know stereotypical land part you know event or whatever like this was a first and foremost a really cool cocktail bar with a beautiful back bar selection of spirits and liqueurs dim lights really cool music it just happened to have a bunch of tvs around the walls with cables running to console games behind the bar uh and there were tables in front of each tv where there were uh console controllers hooked up you know forget pool tables or dance floors multiplayer turn-based video games would get strangers interacting more than anything else but it was a very small bar as well 60 person capacity uh and we opened up a couple of venues me and uh, a couple of other friends um you know got together and did this and this was actually one of the first 
proper uh, video game bars uh, in the world. Before that, there was Dave and Buster's. Mm -hmm. I don't know if that really counts, or a couple of really you know obscure venues in Japan. But this was really one of the first that I I know because a lot of people approached us, uh, inspired a lot of other video game bars around the world. It was it was a very humbling experience. But um, the the thing that frustrated me was my attitude towards bars. And uh, uh, are, are you a, by the way? Are you a bar? Uh, do you drink? Do you go out to cocktail bars? Are you a Not bar person? Often, but I have been. I've and I've been to some gaming bars that have made their way to. Okay. Myself. All right. All right. Cool. 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 So the the trick with a the trick with a, a small venue bar, right, is you got to have a gimmick. You mm. got to have a gimmick to actually get people there. So people would op open a cocktail bar, and they're serving their drinks out of baked bean cans right and it's like nice. everyone's like oh my god have you been to that new that new place they serve their cocktails out of baked bean cans oh that's amazing and everyone goes there for the first three months and then after that everyone's like oh have you been to that bar with the serve the drinks out of the baked bean cans and everyone's like yeah yeah i went there i've been there i experienced it i don't need to go back so you've got to have a gimmick for a small venue but then you've got to have something that keeps people coming back and i, I fervently believe that gaming is an awesome gimmick to have because as long as the gaming industry is still evolving as long as there's new games continuing to come out you're always going to have new interesting components to your venue to keep people coming back and keep that interest uh, and so we would focus on doing a lot of launch events tied in with you know, uh, you know, big games. So, you know, Grand Theft Auto or Red Dead or Saints Row or like every time there was a new game release uh, uh, in Australia, they'd release on Thursday. So there was usually a midnight Wednesday release. So we'd work with the publishers, get the game playable at our bar on the Wednesday. So we'd do a Wednesday party for it. And I thought that, I thought that was awesome. If I, I'm, I'm like, yeah, come to the bar and play you know red dead redemption before it comes out yeah this is great but that was that was actually probably one of my biggest mistakes really? uh single player uh, narrative um... uh games do not translate well to a bar environment even though we had turtle beach headsets with every tv but more importantly they're not social like mm -hmm. you know and, and more importantly you, you want people to to play and then pass the controller and move around but if if the game's not out, people want to sit there and play it. <laughs> so yeah, 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 yeah. you you get people just just like they they like oh yeah great and then they sit there for two hours and no one else would be able to use that TV uh, and uh, and that didn't go as as well as we hoped. Oh and one other quick thing as well, we uh, worked on uh, we did a lot of gaming events uh, tournaments. And things like this we actually worked with some amazing people that ended up being the people that ran esl uh in australia and southeast asia and stuff they were awesome people but what we found is when you run professional esports and gaming tournaments in a bar no one drinks because they're all real fucking serious about winning the game and that does not work at a bar so mm -hmm. early on i learned that we will do tournaments but they will be fun silly stupid tournaments not serious esports professional events so those are the two for anyone opening up gaming bars that's my that's that's my tips to you right yeah that's 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 I mean, it's like uh, with the single player thing, it's like when you go over to your friend's house and he just sits there playing the game and you don't even get to touch the controller. Exactly. For... <laughs> yeah, and, and you're like, hey, can I have a go? It's like, yeah, just yeah. after this level, just after this mission. Yeah, no worries. Yeah, sure. Now try that with strangers. And yeah, it's yeah, like, yeah. you're not getting to go of the game. Yeah, that's tough. Uh, <laughs> how'd you keep the controllers clean? <laughs> uh, we would actually go around uh, every 15 minutes or so with... Um, uh, wet wipes mm -hmm. and we'd actually just uh we'd wipe them down actually our staff were very well trained uh, our glasses as they'd go out so it's very different here in america i'm not sure how it is in canada but uh in in, in australia uh everyone comes to the bar to order a drink and then they go to their seats there's no real it's not really table service right yep. so you go to the bar grab your drink go to your table drink the drink and then you're your, what we call glasses would go around and collect the glasses and bring them back, wipe the table down and keep it clean. So as they'd go out into the bar to collect the glasses, they'd also keep an eye on any controllers that weren't being used at that moment. And they'd go over and they'd wipe them down with, with Lysol. Uh, and here, here's another one, which is kind of fun and unfortunate, an unfortunate stereotype, 
of uh, of of gamers oh, no. is yeah you know like for the most part it was fine but you get 60 people in a tight room drinking and playing video games there's there's some smells that will go down mm -hmm. so these servers would also have uh have a spray can of um I was going to say WD-40, but that's not the right one. No, it was like one of this industrial strength kind of uh, air freshener. And as they walked out in the crowd, they just spray it a little bit as they walked as they walked around. Um, that's not to say... I, by the way, I, I fully reject the idea that, you know, gamers are antisocial, stereotypical, pasty, white, fat nerds that live in their parents' basements. I hate that stereotype. Mm -hmm. But when you run conventions or any any small or large event at scale... It doesn't matter if it's gamers or not. You're gonna get some weird smells, so you mm -hmm. have to deal with that. No, no, no. That 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 rings true. There was a uh, a card game shop, Magic the Gathering store, in in this city that bought the like most expensive air freshening air conditioner I've ever heard of, um, specifically <laughs> for for these cause. Um, yeah, but it, just just to just to avoid the stereotype, like the worst smells I've ever actually smelt, frankly, were at uh, uh, fantasy football organized meets right so like you know fuck the idea that's just the nerds and whatever no sorry it's just it's just fans in general you got to control that stuff so yeah no um that's that's cool though i i, I it is fascinating to hear about the the, the gamer bar days because uh i'm they, they i've been to a couple here in the city uh, and the experience has been a little hit or miss like i've had a good time at, at them but i've also got had frustrations where like hardware is broken and like in low repair and that kind of thing and um yeah i think i think it's really hard with a with with a a lot of venues especially when they get to scale so i think it's uh there's insert coins in vegas for example is a mm -hmm. huge venue but if you don't keep an eye on those controllers like the worst experience you can have is like you go up to try and play a game and there's like sticky buttons or whatever mm -hmm. like you really got to keep an eye on that stuff and then there's the the collaborations with the publishers, like, you know, what they allow or don't allow you to do. And uh, I, I think it's, and, and actually tabletop games, tabletop games are, are huge now, but I think that's really hard to run a, a commercially successful bar with tabletop games because you, you just don't have movement from, from people, but right. it's, it's, I'm, I'm so happy that it's a, it's a thing. I'm so happy that, gaming bars from video games to tabletop exist and that they are thriving and growing um and i'm actually very humbled to be a, a, a small part of of the history of that so mm -hmm. it's cool what what do you think are the biggest similarities and differences uh between you know running a a game bar and what you what you're doing now what you were what you've been doing with uh, the convention space so, uh, scale, scale, yes. man. Like, you know, you do a bar, it's like 60 people or a hundred people. Like, you know, uh, the PAX West and PAX East were like, you know, a hundred, well, over a hundred thousand people, like over, over three to four days. Like, it's just the scale. Like, uh, you can, you can have a lot more control. Uh, you can be a lot more agile in, in putting on events or working with developers or publishers at, at a bar, but at a convention, you've got to plan that stuff. Uh, you know, out way in advance. The flip side is that uh, the great thing about working on on these large events is you can genuinely affect and change people's lives. Like it's it's really gratifying. And you talk to any of the people, you know, at whether it be at Read Pop or the PAX events or Informal with GDC or the Gamescom folks, or you talk to any of the people that work on them, from sales to to content to marketing and the moments that you live for are when, you know, uh, you get an indie developer that's a little unsure of themselves and they exhibit their game in the, the PAX Arena or the Indie Mega Booth or something like that. And they they get some amazing write-ups in, in some articles. They get, you know, a, a Jesse Cox comes by and plays their games and then, and then does a big YouTube video about us. Like, stuff like that. Like, that's... that's that, magic it's the same with like it's the same with any sport right like you you see there's the moments that really affect you and those moments can only happen at scale at uh at these events um where you you've got all these significant people congregated at the same time um i'd say that's the biggest difference between a tiny little gaming bar 
and these large scale events is you can really change people's lives. It's it's funny because you literally just described our experience. <laughs> it's like oh, really? our, our our first our first Pax West showing. It was literally my first game ever. Um, you know, we had a lot of really good reception from it, and then Jesse Cox played our game. Uh, <laughs> that's that's amazing. I love Jesse. He's 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 the best. But uh, it's uh, and and this the thing like it's it's really hard for people to justify the costs mm -hmm. of these conventions. Like it's they are there's we all know they are so fucking expensive. They are so overpriced for indie developers, and it's because you can justify the costs for the larger publishers that have the money to pay for it. So, you know, Microsoft takes up this giant booth, but of course they have the money to pay for that. Mm -hmm. But, you know, for the indie developers, you know, for these, these smaller booths, like, you've got to balance that up, like, the, the risk and reward. But um, was it worth it, you know, when you when you pay that much and, and you get that one that one content creator that comes and plays it or that one journalist that comes and sees it's really hard to to mm -hmm. balance that the roi uh against the amount that you spend one of my best friends back in australia uh used to run a, a development studio called flat earth games and their game was this hardcore submarine pixel based space sim trading simulator mm -hmm. and their their the way you played it was with a custom giant three-piece controller it was like something for the gdc alt uh control mm -hmm. kind of uh setup but they 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 went to uh pax east i think it was and like the audience for that is so fucking small mm -hmm. like what's the what's the really are they gonna make their money back from that no absolutely not but uh, they had, I think it was Total Biscuit. I think Total Biscuit stopped by their booth and played the game. And he was like, this is the best game ever. And then he went and did a YouTube video on it. And that that one video like justified the entire trip, the entire thing. Like Those are the moments that are kind of intangible and a little bit hard to sell mm -hmm. as a justification for, uh, for attending these events. But they do happen. So, so we've started completely discounting the roi as part of the equation on whether or not we do a show um, yeah you kind of gotta it's, it's so wildly unpredictable and you know it, it, the the overall value of an individual write-up has slowly decreased over the years and a lot of little factors have gone into it but yeah I, i'm curious since you have so much experience for devs indie devs in particular going into their shows what are the things that make a successful dev presence? Right. So uh, I, I think the the main thing is uh, <laughs> you have to hustle. Mm -hmm. There is nothing worse than seeing a, a booth with a developer there and the developer is sitting at their chair checking their phone. I'm sorry, but if you're going to actually pay the exorbitant amount of money to get a booth to be at a convention you should be you should be like one of those uh was uh, the old-timey uh uh people with like the with the canes and the like the like out right. there like hey ladies and gentlemen you've never seen anything like this before step right up step right up you should play our game like like that level of getting people to play your game because it's that that's what it is you you want as many people through hey, here's the other thing is uh, when we talk about these conventions, whether it be Comic Cons or PAX or whatever, and it's like, oh, Comic Con has quarter of a million people and PAX has hundreds of thousands of people, sure, but you're not going to get a hundred thousand people playing your game. You can only get a certain amount of people playing your game within a period of time per day. If your demo is five minutes long and you can only have two people playing your demo, so that's uh, you know uh, two people for five minutes, so four people ten minutes. So, oh my God, I'm going to remember this. Uh, so that's four times six, 24 people per hour. Uh, so like you expand that out and actually the amount of people that can play your game during any, a particular day is only a finite amount. And you've really got to factor that in. You've really got to think about how many people can get hands-on experience with your game. Because the hands-on experience is so much more meaningful than just downloading the demo and playing at home or watching a trailer on YouTube. And that's really what it's about. So how many other ways can you engage and interact with an audience? Uh, one, one of my favorite examples was, there's a game called uh, Hacknet, which came out years ago uh, by Matt uh, Triviani. 
And uh, this game, the interface, it's a hacking game. It looks like a fucking MS DOS prompt. Like it, it, it is not an aesthetically eye grabbing game. It's an amazing game, and I recommend everyone play it. But to to have that game at a booth to exhibit is is a really is a really tough sell. He they did a lot of stuff with with that uh, that booth where they're exhibiting where it was there was the person playing the game but then they had a lot of other factors a lot of other tournaments or a lot of other uh things around their booth to engage people that were watching as well you need to do everything you can to try and engage as many people in as many different ways not just playing your game but talking about your game looking at the game make sure you've got a screen showcasing the game have some have another screen with the trailer of the game have a leaderboard that actually has these are the top players of the day and you know what the top players at the end of the day they're going to get a prize here have a pin here have a flyer here like everything mm-hmm. you can do sell your fucking game uh, you know, make the most of that experience because you also never know who the person is that's that's playing your game. It could be just a random person in the public. It could be uh, a massively high-profile streamer. It could be an influential uh, person in the media. It could be someone from another convention that's like, you should apply for our competition. Like, you never know. I I I, I just get very frustrated when I uh, when there were people that would exhibit at the conventions I would run. And they'd have a booth, and they'd have a TV, and they'd have a computer, and you could play their game, but would you right. want to? <clears throat> right, no. Right, right. So, yeah. Uh, chat brings up being very proactive about um, uh, using the press list provided by the conventions, etc. But I also kind of want to balance that against, like, uh, when when you as an indie developer, you enter a convention, like you mentioned earlier, there's a lot of different priorities that you can have. You know, there's the there's the hands on play time. There's the press and media. There's um, also the uh, courting publishers or having even you know uh, talking with other developers for collaborations and these kind of things. There's a whole lot to do at these events, and I feel like FOMO can really set in very hard <laughs> um, when there's yeah. that much to do. So I, I'm curious, how do you personally battle FOMO, and how do you? Uh, suggest that other developers, you know, organize and 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 sort of plot themselves to avoid that horrid, oh. horrid social experience. <laughs> okay, well, from for me personally, uh, the you battle FOMO by not caring. Mm-hmm. Uh, the last the last couple of years with PAXs, I would actually spend most of my PAXs in meetings with people talking about the next PAXs. So, like the the the, the FOMO of missing out on things, you've just got to get past that. You've just got to ignore that. Uh, for developers or any exhibitors, like uh, you just need to be focused on what your purpose is for being there. If you are at a point in your game development where you are going to a convention because you are trying to court investors or publishers, uh, you're going to take a slightly different angle to the person exhibiting next to you that's just trying to get their wish lists up. Right, and don't get me wrong. Like you get your uh, high wish list on Steam, you're going to get more attention from publishers and developers. But it's still a different mindset that you're going into it with. Uh, and same with like you know your media lists or whatnot. And keep in mind as well, PAX is pretty liberal with handing out its media list to mm-hmm. uh, to its exhibitors. Whereas other events like EGX or Gamescom and, and stuff like that, they it's more of a bespoke. Oh, you want to give us your press release and we will hand it on to to media outlets. And if what you're after is press, if what you're after is content creators knowing about your game, you've got to craft your message accordingly. If you try and appeal to everyone, if you go to a convention and you're like, we want consumers to play our games, we want consumers to wish list our games, we want publishers and investors to stop by our booth and talk to us about our games, we want media to come and play our games, we want content creators to ask about our games. If you try and do all of that at once, unless you are a large publisher with multiple people that actually have full-time jobs that focus on those specific roles, you will fail. Uh, You should choose to maybe three of those particular things and focus on those uh and and recognize that you know if you don't get a lot of wish lists that's fine but if you got two investors that came by your booth and played your games and you're going to have follow-up meetings with them then it's worth it you just need to it sounds really 
trying, but like you've got to figure out the the ROI of of going to these events and what that means to you. Right. No. No. I mean, even if it is super basic stuff, like it, it can be one of those things that can fly over your head in the in the heat of planning and and you know totally. when you're actually there. You know, keeping your priorities totally. straight is really important. Yeah. For sure. Totally. For sure. Yeah. Um. I guess I guess as we start to, to, to reach the end of things, um what's what's going on with the gig now and and what will be going on in the future? Oh no man. You should join it. You should, should tell it. tell me what you think it should tell me what you think it should be. Uh I don't know what we're doing. Like we're you know, we created this thing during a pandemic. Mm -hmm. Like um we've got we we do a lot of we do a lot of stuff during other events. So GDC is happening next week. Uh, so we're going to do a GDC gig uh, where, well, not a, it's not a GDC gig. Uh, that might infringe on some right. copyrights or whatever. It's, it's, we're the calling it the, we're actually calling it the not another GDC party. <laughs> so, um, but uh, we're working with games and street biz and meet to match. And uh, again, the idea is just, just to have a space where people can actually network and socialize. Um, but when events start to come back physically, uh, I, I, there's this one thing that we've done with the gig, which was not part of the original plan, but something I'm very proud of. Uh, and that's that we've curated the membership to be uh, much more diverse than the games industry actually is. Mm -hmm. So, uh, you know, w there was massive controversies with uh hotel bars around gaming conventions in the in the many many years as evidenced by a very strong me too movement that came out of the games you know that happened to the games industry uh a couple of years ago and frankly is, is still happening and, and still these stories coming out and and it's it it kind of feels like it's a it's a it's because a lot of these spaces are held by you know, just your your ninety percent white dudes that are, <laughs> that are in these spaces. You know, like you don't have a lot of representation. The worst thing is that you, you know when you don't have people of of underrepresented um, you know groups that are in these these game industry spaces, they don't feel comfortable in them. Then they don't come to them. Then it's a self self fulfilling prophecy. Uh, and one of the things that we did with the gig, and this was not me, this was the other some other amazing people associations that that we worked with uh, gay gaming professionals and latinx and gaming and uh, the igda foundation and and just all these groups that were like you know what you you should curate the members of the gig to try and be uh more representative of what we hope the games industry could be mm -hmm. uh so the the membership of the gig is is uh is weighted pretty pretty evenly i think at the moment we're sitting at about 40 percent of the members are are, are women or non-binary folks and uh, i think about 20 percent are people of color at a global level and so what i'd like to do is start to have physical uh events and parties where it's folks from the gig but hopefully we can have you know a bit more representation and a bit more diversity within them but also a, a lot more accountability. So if if someone's a, if, you know, if someone's a, someone's an asshole, yes. if someone's a, a jerk that, you know, uh, is, is called out, then they're going to get kicked out, and they're they're not going to be welcome back to that event. Uh, and I think that's that's something that's severely lacking in the games industry at the moment. You know, so that's. I don't know. Maybe. Hopefully, we'll see what happens, man. Right, so, right, but that's right. that's that's one of the the things that I, I think would be really cool. So, yeah. Oh, cool. So, I, I mean, just just for my, my my comprehension, is this is the what how, what is the curation process then? Is it are you outreaching to communities or are you papers pleasing uh, applications well, or what is? Thank, yeah, thankfully at this point, like it's it's sizable enough that there's a lot of people that are actually coming uh, applying for the gig and. Uh, and we're able to actually, um, you know, uh, bring them in and keep that level of diversity. Although I will say uh, that there's about a there's a wait list at the moment. I mean, Frank, there's a there's a wait list at the moment of about 600 white dudes. <laughs> it's just, it's but that's the only way to actually keep that certain level. And, and frankly, if someone wants to apply and they're like, yeah, I want to get into this, you know what? Honestly, 
invite another friend of yours from a uh, underrepresented group like you know that's that's the that's the only way i'm real sorry there's a bunch i mean you, you and i know this there's a bunch of white dudes that can't get into an event oh poor things like you know it's that's that's uh that's the way we've been curating it it's not fair but uh but i don't care so yeah interesting okay well yeah uh <laughs> no i mean it, i i value um diversity in social situations because of the unique perspective i get a little tired of the same conversation over and over again and it's kind of like we we have uh social events in toronto that i used to go to until um i had those conversations and then i had them again and again and again and, yeah and that kind of gets worn out and i'm not saying that uh you know having a, a diverse group a, a ethnically or culturally diverse group of people will guarantee that variety in conversation but no. the, uh, having a, a broad set of perspectives, lived ex perspectives, tends to generate more unique conversations, and that's kind of what I crave in social situations. Oh my god, totally. I, I, I think there's I think there's two real important factors here that we're learning lessons from me as well. That I, that I would obviously look at me. I would never actually have thought about, and that is, you know, when we're doing this these gig rooms, uh, you know, it's kind of. You know, a woman goes into a, a, a room or a networking event and it's just full of a bunch of other white dudes. And it's like, you know, it's it's a little tiring sort of thing. So to try and curate something with the gig where it's like there's there's at least a, li a few more people that are representative of, of who they are in the games industry and it makes them feel much more welcome. I think that's 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 really important and that's that's really critical. And the other one is trying to curate a space where... Frankly, within the gig, diversity and representation isn't the conversation because mm -hmm. we're handling that at a registration level. So it just is what it is. So people can just chat about whatever they want to chat about, but in an environment that has more representation. And I should clarify, we're not perfect. Like we're not, we're not fifty-fifty. We're not. Uh, there's still so many mistakes that we're making, especially with with people of color as well. Like I want to do more, but like that should be the thing like that should be the aspiration is like i want to keep doing more but in order to just for the space to exist how we hope that the gaming industry will will be so right, right. yeah right. no that all sounds really really cool um if people are listening and they are interested uh what it, where do they go how do they how do they apply uh to get there you can head to the uh, Games Industry Gathering, which I think is gamesindustrygathering.com uh, or games.industrygathering.com. I genuinely can't remember if we have both domain names, but just look it up. You can find it. Um, it's not it's not hard to find. And when you register and sign up, it does ask for you to refer someone, uh, but that's mainly just if we want to actually check and see if, you know, because we, we vet everyone that joins to make sure that they actually are in the games industry so there are no students or hobbyists or folks that aren't uh, professional in the games industry in one way or another cool right well uh thank you very much for coming on thank you for this chat it was very it's very different from my normal dev chats and i like it when wait wait what what are the normal dev chats like what oh, do you mean how is this way different? more exciting and like you know they just have so much more information and, and knowledge oh, damn it. and uh it's it's just the way it goes, you know. <laughs> I'm sorry, I let I let you down, man. No, no, All no, right. no, it's okay. You know, we need a light one every now and then. <laughs> <laughs> I'm I'm happy to take one for the team. All right, fine. Right on. Now, thank you very much, uh, gang. Uh, we're gonna sign off now, and uh, I guess I'll see you tomorrow. We're gonna do more game development. That's what we do here on this channel. Um, thank you, thank you again for stopping by, and thank you everybody for in the chat. Goodbye. <laughs>